<laughs> Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm Scott Wheeler, the host of the show. For almost 100 years, the Old Stone House Museum in Brownington has been sharing and preserving the history of Orleans County. Today's guests are two members of the Historical Society, Peggy Day Gibson and Susanna Bowman. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. So let me start with you, uh, Peggy. Uh, what is your role at the uh, Historical Society? I'm the director. You're the director, so, you, so you're, you lead the charge. I lead the charge. How long have you been in that role? Uh, since January of 2007, right. and uh, before that I was the education coordinator, which is what Susanna is now. All right, Susanna. Well, um, this will be my fifth year there, um, and it's been a very challenging five years, and we have implemented a lot of different programs, and it's been fun. You know, as you know, as uh, we have a great working relationship between your museum and my right, and, and I think you guys are doing a great job at doing what you do. Thanks. So, we um, try hard. <laughs> so uh, you're working on a project now. You're building a barn. Right. And this isn't just any barn. No, not just any barn. We are um, building a replica of the barn that was originally built beside the old stone house by Alexander Twilight just after he built the old stone house in 1836. Mm -hmm. And the barn was taken down in 1924, just before the old stone house was opened as the Museum of Orleans County History. Now, do you have a photo of what the barn used to look we like? We do. We have several photos. Right. Um, we wish we had more. We only have them from a little from the front where there's a lot of vegetation that uh, shields it and some from the back. We don't have any from the east side. If anybody out there has oh, any right. photos of, of the barn, the old stone house with the barn, we'd love to see them because we can enlarge them on the computer and really get the detail. And actually I'll, what I'll do is I'll have uh, Todd put the, uh, the picture up on the screen right now so the viewers can see it. Okay. So uh, has this been an ongoing project or? Oh, we've been thinking about it for years and, you know, many, many people, you know, for 30 years have been thinking we should rebuild this old barn. And we are in the position now where we have a lot of um, antique farm equipment that we don't have room to display. And also, um, Jessie Mitchell uh, generously left us a bequest in her will for the Old Stone House Farm Museum, which was perfect because we had been thinking we've got to build a barn to tell the story of farming in Orleans County, which is such a huge part of our history. And uh, she's enabled us to do that. And, and we also have gotten another grant from the Preservation Trust of Vermont uh, in partnership with the Freeman Foundation. Now, how big is this going to be? 25 by 40. Right. Now, are you doing it the modern way, or are you going to be doing it the old-fashioned way? We're building a timber frame barn, um, and the Timber Framers Guild is going to come from June 1st to June 10th and cut out all of the posts and beams uh, at the museum while they hold workshops for their members. They're also going to hand hew three 40-foot beams and a couple of posts. And then we're going to have a big barn raising on June the 9th. And everybody is welcome to come watch. And um, at the end of the day, we'll have a celebration barbecue. And has either one of you uh, hand-hewed a beam before? We've, we have um, worked with the kids and demonstrated it because they built a, the blacksmith shop, the forge, um, two years ago. And we had several um, adult carpenters experienced in historic techniques who had the kids out there um, with the broad axe and so on, very carefully, but they, you know, we have done that there. But what I wanted to ask you actually is, are these workshops going to be, that the timber framers are going to do, are they going to be open to the public at some point or not? Um, that is hard to say. I mean, okay. it, I think it is in a case by case thing that if an experienced carpenter comes over and gets involved, they can join in. It, they're not like, you know, we're going to teach you about timber framing, here's how you start. But people who know what they're doing can join in. And then we're also going to have plenty of opportunities for volunteers. Uh, what One thing we want to do is um, oil every beam with linseed oil. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have lots of uh, sawhorses set up and plenty for volunteers to do. We'll also have a few more pegs to make. 
um, I think there'll be volunteer opportunities and plenty of opportunities to watch what's going on. And they're coming when? Which date? June 1st through the 10th. Uh -huh. And we're going to put them up in the Samuel Reed Hall house, mm -hmm. and they're also going to tent on the surrounding grounds, and we feed them. Oh, and you know what? We're looking for food donations. <laughs> we also have another group of young history reenactors coming from Providence, Rhode Island, um, whose name escapes me at the moment, but they will be there the weekend of the barn raising, and they will be participating. They have been learning historic building techniques as well, so that's going to be pretty fun. And they'll so, be camping right there yeah. on the grounds in all their regalia. Yeah, yeah. So even the wood is local. Oh, yeah. Alan Yale, who is a member of our board of directors, has a forest that was planted in the 50s during the land bank era mm -hmm. that is um, a lot of white pine and hemlock. And um, so he has been cutting it down and also the timber harvesting class at the North Country mm -hmm. Career Center, um, Fern Fontaine is the instructor, they came in January and cut down a lot of trees and then they brought them over to the land lab which the Career Center runs on the Quarry Road, and they milled them with their wood miser portable sawmill, mm -hmm. and they cut boards. And then uh, the uh, wood went over to the building trades class where we sent our lead timber framer, Mikayo Maher, mm -hmm. in for a couple of weeks to the building trades class, and he taught them about timber framing, and they notched the sills and the floor joists, and they're going to, and they, and the, um, that's this part. Yeah, and that's all hemlock. <laughs> the the sills, the floor joists, and the deck are all mm -hmm. hemlock, and they're going to come and lay that deck over the foundation um, in mid-May. So this is a real community effort. It is. And, and part of we want all the kids, we want a lot of kids in this area to be involved in it and be part of it because this is history being made. And all these young people who have a part of it, that all their lives they'll know, I helped build that barn at the old stone house, and it's going to take a lot of community involvement and a lot of people feeling pride and feeling ownership in that museum to keep this wonderful place going. We, in our, in our little bit of research and um, Peggy's research, uh, find, we found that the last actual large timber frame barn that was raised in our county that we are aware of, and if you know about one that we don't know about, please tell us, um, was probably in the 50s. 1954. And that was what that family? That was Harry Rowell mm -hmm. and his family in South Albany. So this is an opportunity to see a large barn being assembled and raised that you may not ever see again, probably haven't seen in your lifetime. We hope maybe you'll get inspired mm -hmm. and do one likewise. Though I have to say that that there are some timber frame companies uh, active right now. I mean, timber framing came back in the late 70s and 80s and 90s, and, and that's why the Timber Framers Guild is around, because mm -hmm. they ha have led the charge in reviving this old art. But um, probably not going um, the same way. <laughs> Mikayo Maher uh, has a timber frame company called mm -hmm. um, Green Timber Works, and then there was Old School Builders in Glover, mm -hmm. and so there actually have been quite a few timber frame houses that have gone up, and a few timber frame barns have gone up in recent years, and I've seen them raised, and it's really a lot of fun, but most of them go up with a crane. Right. We're going to push ours up with pikes and pull it up with ropes, and it'll be all done the old-fashioned mm -hmm. way. Now, you're not going to do it the way it's said that the museum was built, where they had an oxen to lift the uh, wood? Well, we might have a team of horses oh, really? um, with block and tackle. Um, we might have some oxen. And we'll certainly I have a good. lot of people pushing it up with pikes and pulling it up with ropes. And um, it'll be quite quite something to see. You know, one time when I talked to you, the uh, you were having an issue with finding... Um, granite blocks for underneath it. Did you did you manage to take care of that yet or do you still need more? I think more? I, I I might need a few more. Um, I think I think we're about there. Uh, 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 fellow uh, Father John Kinney who actually lives up the hill from me mm -hmm. took down the old Uri homestead on the top of Beach mm -hmm. Hill a few years ago and John Rogers who's actually going to build our granite foundation um, he's the guy that took it down right. and um, so he said I don't think that John is going to, that 
Father Kenny is going to use these granites. His plans have changed. So I went up to see Father Kenny the other day, and he had my, my little letter to the Chronicles all cut out sitting by his phone. He just hadn't gotten around to calling me, and he said we could have them all. So mm -hmm. um, we've got those. We've got about five of them from um, a place down the Hinman Road, and I think we might need a few more. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to now start putting them in and see, see how far we go. But if anybody does have those granite stones, what we're looking for, we want them at least 8 inches wide on the top, 18 inches deep so that they set quite a bit on, uh, below the surface and then stick out of the surface at least 10 inches. And then they can be as long, 3, 4, 5, 6, six feet long. There must be quite a few of them around. It's just finding them or maybe getting at them because mm -hmm. you know we've had a lot of farms go out in recent decades and right. you know a lot of houses have rever reverted back to uh, wilderness mm -hmm. but you you're probably getting some that you just can't get at well there's some that are below ground and if the house burned down if it was a really hot fire oh, sometimes they're the cracked um, and then uh, a lot of them also high drives. A lot of the high drives were built with those. And, That's true. You know, and then people want them. I mean, they're great for landscaping. So we need to find them, and then we need to find people who are willing to give them to us. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we are a 501c3 corporation, and any, any gift uh, can be a tax write-off. Right. You know, tell me, is the barn you build, are building, is this... Is it like this? Not exactly. It's um, it has the same number of bays, though, right? Yeah, it has three bays. Um, the the one there's a the narrower bay is on the west side, which was the stable, um, and then a nice big center bay where the mm -hmm. wagon would have gone in, and then the bay on the east side is the widest because that's where the feed was kept. Um, this is a two-story house. This barn was. I guess you'd call it a story and a half. Mm -hmm. the, the rafters come right down over here. So right. it doesn't have this second story. Um, but it, will, the, it sets right beside the stone house. So the, it's, the stone house runs a lot like this. And in the back of the stone house was a cistern, mm -hmm. and they collected water off the roof, which then was piped down through in a pipe below the root cellar and came out in a reservoir right in the kitchen. And uh, you could go out the kitchen of the stone house into the root cellar, into a little connecting shed, and then into the barn to the stable to feed the animals. And you could just open up this little reservoir, scoop the water with your bucket, mm -hmm. and go out and water your cows. And yeah. I think maybe that was the way they did it. As I said um, at the beginning of the show, you've been preserving history there for almost 100 years. How how have you been able to conclude what life was like there before it became a museum? Well, we did some archaeology um, last summer, and that's a very good way to find out um, what people wore, what people ate, um, what they, what kind of occupations they were involved in. And there was a midden heap, which is a garbage pile, basically, <laughs> out behind this barn. And we found one particular, if the stone house is here, the garbage pile was out along this wall, away from it. Um, and we found all sorts of interesting things there, from eating utensils, forks, and knives. We found um, rusted milk strainers for separating, you know, the cream and, um, oh, heavens. We found buttons, and we found nails of all sorts and different ages, which helped us to um, figure out when, when the barn was built and when different additions or um, fixing up was was take you know was completed um and of course the deeper you go the older the stuff is generally unless the soil has been disturbed which it was because they cleaned up the site so that kind of muddied the evidence a bit so in past decades have people who worked at the museum had the foresight to interview people say who were alive say in the late 1800s so they could have Provided some insight There's one too. interesting yeah. one going on right now with um, Mrs. Lawrence. Right. Oh, oh, with Florence Thompson. Thompson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Florence Thompson. Um, 
she's our neighbor. She's um, 101 mm -hmm. year old and years old. And she actually still lives in the same house she was born in, hmm. which is across the field. So, you know, we, so Stone House is here. And actually the Stone House property ends right here. And then there's this big field. And when you see the pictures of the barn, most of them were taken from Florence's field. In fact, one of them has her father in the field hmm. uh, harvesting wheat. And that was taken around 1911. And so Florence was born in the same house she lives in now. And we've been interviewing her about things that happened. But about this barn, I'd also like to say that um, there's a fellow named Dale Clark who mm -hmm. used to live um, in, in the Eaton House at the Stone House in the mm -hmm. uh, late 1970s. And he interviewed a lady who had lived in the Stone House. Her aunt, it was run as a boarding house for many years after mm -hmm. it closed as a school dormitory. And this lady had been a little girl living there when her aunt owned the boarding house and ran it. And so she had described what the barn was like. So we do have notes on her interview, which did say that this was the stable area. And about the midden, you know, the trash thrown out, it was not necessarily thrown out from the school dormitory. It could very well have been thrown out when it was run as a boarding house, right. which was from about 1858 uh, right on up through 1915. We did find we did find some china and stuff that was fairly old. Um, of course, you could throw it out that out at any point. Um, a, a couple of years before we began this project, actually, the children at the camp began to uncover the footprint of the foundation, mm -hmm. and that was really before I I was aware that photographs existed. Um, so this has been kind of a, an interesting process of finding um, actually archaeological remains, documentation, photographs. We found, we've read about it, um, you know, in the records of the historical society, you know, telling us that they got rid of it. Um, so it's all of the different sources of evidence to learn about this barn. We've been trying to like, well, avail I ourselves of. I have a, uh, there used to be an old barn on my property. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it was interesting because it, you know, I could I could kind of visualize maybe what it looked like by looking at the footprints. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, is back a couple of years ago, I came across photos of yeah. it. And to, to be realistic, is I, I guess I hadn't studied it that much because I was really amazed on just how big the farm. Mm -hmm was uh it was a it was a big barn well you can you can tell you can tell like the the dimensions sometimes but you have no idea it, really how how tall it was i mean m looking at many of these old photographs there three what we would consider three or four stories tall because they um had the hay in it yeah. right yeah they had loose hay <laughs> so they need a lot of room so it's, it sounds like you actually have a lot of fun doing this too, because a little bit of detective work. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it's what great. history is: detective yeah. work. Right, right. <laughs> now, have, yeah. have you ever done anything at the old stone house where, where you thought you knew something, but after a little bit of research, <laughs> you realized that your original assumptions were wrong? Yeah, sure. <laughs> what's, what's your big one? It, sounds, it looks well, like you had a big one. I've been I've been telling everybody cheese. People were making a lot of cheese in their in their homes and you know farmstead cheese, and they made it for their own consumption and they made it to sell. And this was the big thing. I just finally actually read the Vermont Agricultural Census, and at least in terms of what they were willing to admit that they were making, they were making so much more butter here. And from early on. And um, mm -hmm. so, like, I was really embarrassed. Well, no, but that's, that's okay, because <laughs> you're at least willing to admit the errors. And I'm sure there was some cheese. Like, yeah, there like, was some, but right. not, like, the but big product. But the thing product is, 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 I will tell you from interviewing people who are well in their 90s now, uh, there was a tremendous amount of butter that was made. Mm -hmm. And I think right. that was, I think uh, that was, you know, as a byproduct, too. But they, like, during the Depression, uh, they bartered a lot mm -hmm. of butter for food, um, so there was a lot of butter made. And do you know that they had dogs, sheep, goats, and horses churning the butter? 
Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Animal. If you've power. ever seen those um, horse treadle machines, and there, and we, and there's even smaller ones for dog, sheep, and goat. We do have some in the Lawrence barn where we have a lot of antique farm equipment collected already. Um, there were treadle machines, and and the, the animals would be trained to get on them, and they would just lead them up, and the oh sure, and I it was slanted a little, and they just had to keep walking, or they'd slip right off the sure, back. Sure, I, mm -hmm. I have a I have a postcard of a cow on one of it's like like kind of like a a human's treadmill it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. it is so so yeah. so if we're going to insist upon getting our exercise on a treadmill versus hard work why don't we why don't we do something constructive at the same time and make <laughs> well, butter or cheese or <laughs> why don't why aren't we powering our lights yeah well, that's true yeah, what do we need windmills for? <laughs> yeah, yeah hitch, it, <laughs> hitch it up to our tread. But unfortunately, here's the secret about treadmills. I have a feeling we wouldn't generate much electricity because how many of those treadmills kind of like sit there being used as like clothes hangers? <laughs> So, well, wishful thinking. I am going to get my exercise and get healthy, and then <laughs> buy all this stuff. And that's what's for sale in the Green Mountain Trading Post. Yep. <laughs> all right, we have a we have a little under ten more minutes left. What more would you like to tell the viewers about this project or anything else you're working on? Well, um, we are attempting to get a lot of mile educational mileage out of this building project, just like we did out of building the blacksmith shop. Um, and so we are taking um, we are taking a whole program out into the schools who have um, requested it, and we are taking shave horses and draw knives, and we're taking fros and um, lumber, and we are taking old tools and alternative methods of measuring and uh, all sorts of things to do basic architectural literacy. In the schools, and we hope that um, we hope that this will inspire the kids and the teachers and the people who live here to not only appreciate and take care of the ones we have, but um, maybe even to build some that that are harmonious with that type of building. So that's a big one. And I, I've been taking a lot of photographs of the old barns in the area, and I would uh, ask all the public to grab those photographs of the old mm. barns because they're going fast and they're so interesting and if we just could have a record of them and i realize we can't all afford to fix them up again we you know we don't have the use form you know it's thirty thousand fifty thousand to fix up old barns but you can get grants through the uh, vermont division of historic preservation mm. to fix up old barns and you might be surprised if you have a, a beautiful old barn you want to save mm -hmm. Go, go to their website and, and check into getting a grant to help you fix up your old barn. You know, when I pass a barn that's collapsed and uh, being a history person myself, I often think, what would that farmer think today, you know, watching his farm, hmm. his barn crumble? Because, you know, the farmers have, you know, are a breed in their own and they really like their barns and then I, I go past them and I see them crumbling and I can just I just think about how many lives went through there but but it is, it is a change in time mm -hmm. now what is your theory why why is it important that we preserve and share any of this history with today's people it's perspective for the future. It's, it's a cache of information. It's like a library. You know, you might not be interested in this particular book today, but maybe a month down the road, you'll think, oh, I need to find something out. And artifacts tell stories just like books do. Yeah. And we're all standing on the knowledge that yeah. people have gained in the past. And, I mean, in the future, what if we do lose our electricity and we have to go back to horsepower? First of all, horsepower is a lot of fun even today. And you just have to feed your horse. You don't have to buy gasoline. And it's, you don't have to make your skitter payment. You can, mm -hmm. you can slowly harvest your woodlot and leave some for future generations because you don't have to knock it all down to make your skitter payment. And in the past, they developed horse-drawn equipment to mm -hmm. such a great degree, um, we can't lose that knowledge that they gained. We need to preserve it. And that's, that's, the, that's the case with many, many hand skills that people say, well, 
can go buy it. Why should I bother to learn how to make it? You know, every artifact, whether it's, you know, needles, knitting needles, um, you know, looms, butter churns, all of these things were the way people survived and lived. And it's... Um, it's just, it's a cache of information. And it, it, it can't survive sitting there as a dusty object. It has to be used and the skills and the hand skills need to be passed on. Otherwise, we won't know how they actually work. You can read it, but it doesn't really tell you. You need to learn how to do it. I, uh, you know, even though I'm only 47, I look at some of the, some of the things that I did as a kid and Things that aren't even done, just in that short short period of time are, you know, almost things of history, history books. And so in that short a period of time, you know, things have changed so much. You know, the one thing though, I often hear people talk about the good old days. You know, good old days, say back when this barn was built. But you know, sometimes uh, the good old days may have been good in some ways, but. They were they were actually tougher in some ways, but also we have to remember with those good old days came that was before immunizations. Mm -hmm. uh, that was there was a lot of deaths in childbirth. So while I am a history person, and both of you are, you know, you have to kind of like there's a mixture of the good and the bad. Right. People, I worked for a while at Old Sturbridge Village, and people um, would ask you, well, if you had to choose between living in 1830, which is at our same time period at this right. museum, sort of, um, or the modern time, what would you choose? And they would expect me to say the good old days, and I would say, well, I've thought about it a lot, and really the reason I would choose today is modern pain management. <laughs> Oh, so so you're not a, you're not a fond lover of pain like I'm not. I'm not a fond lover of pain. You know, I, I when my teeth hurt, oh. I want to go to the dentist, and I don't want them to hurt anymore. Yeah, right. Do you do you, ha <laughs> well, do, do you have any uh, dental equipment there that you no, could we, try we out personally? We, we do. That's what I was going to say. We do have a room, the Henry T Tinkham room, and Henry was a Brownington fellow who helped develop was major in developing the UVM School of Medicine. But we have these antique uh, dental tools, and like, ooh, <laughs> you know, we're glad we're not using them. As it is, just the sound of a drill, you know, going into wood sometimes, just if it squeaks right, makes me think of going to the dentist today. The advantage of the advantage of living in any particular time is that you can look backwards and choose the bits that you like that you think were superior and incorporate them. We can't you can't we can't really incorporate the future, mm -hmm. but that's what we can do and that's why history is important. And I, I would also like to say as a woman, I'm Ugh. glad to be living in these days. Yeah. Uh, I have, have a lot more opportunity mm -hmm. uh, and um, have a lot more respect. Yeah. Though, I mean, I, I think there were certainly brilliant women in the past and they, you know, there were adventurous women who got out there and had, you know, really interesting lives, but a lot of women were just second-class citizens and it's, it's great some of the rights that, that people have developed in modern times. Even, even though, I, I think though, the women of it the women have been the glue of the families though from oh yeah uh, you know throughout throughout the generations because i'm fond of saying and some of my male counterparts might disagree with me i find that women are the far stronger sex you truly you know when i interview my older residents the women are they're they're really the leaders of the family. It's how they choose to, uh, right? You know, choose to show it or whether they do or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, and the strength and the power is kind of uh, from the bottom, right? right you know, I, I yeah, prefer I, I prefer modern female property rights. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Um, we have about another minute. Um, well, no, we maybe have a lot we could just, going on this summer. Yeah, uh, maybe we could just in a couple of dates. Our time travelers camp, with, which is now open for enrollment, um, is starts July twenty third. We have adult education opportunities coming right up here. We got starting with strawberries, uh, May nineteenth. 
um, growing chickens the natural way, quilting. Oh, and a really interesting opportunity, which is casting. This is a fine art process. We have never offered any fine art classes before, but this is a very neat opportunity. That's starting in June. Call for more information. Um, let's see, um, nature journaling, botanical illustration, and cheese making. We've got um, some good home home uh, style cheese making class that's going to come up. So. We have a website, um, oldstonehousemuseum.org, where you can get all the information or call us at 754-2022 and we'll put you on our mailing list. Okay, uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. My favorite topic is history, <laughs> and again, I'll say you guys are doing a wonderful job at the Old Stone House Museum. Thank, thank you, you thank for you. having us, and don't forget the barn raising, June 9th. <laughs> and It'll be fun. thank you to the viewers for tuning in today. <laughs>